All right, very good. Well, thank you very much for coming. My name is Tom Gaze. I'm director of the Rockefeller Institute. And it's a privilege to have this forum at the Rockefeller Institute honoring one of the great governors of New York. Now, granted, it's a little ironic to have it here. Uh, after all, Governor Kerry inherited many of the fiscal problems he struggled with from our own beloved namesake. Or as Hugh Kerry once said, I got hit by a rock slide. <laughs> but there are many good reasons to have the forum here. For instance, we've long studied federalism here at the Institute, uh, especially federal-state relations. Federal federalism scholars, as some of you students might know, like to classify the interactions between the federal and state governments in many different ways. Sometimes they call it cooperative federalism, sometimes they call it new federalism, coercive federalism, or sometimes they like to use metaphors like marble cakes or layer cakes or even uh, picket fence federalism. Well, the Kerry administration was on the receiving end of a new type of federalism announced by the Ford administration. That's uh, forget about it, uh, federalism, also sometimes termed, at least by the Daily News, as drop dead federalism. Well, actually, it wasn't all that innovative, and even though the Ford administration had reversed itself pretty quickly, drop deadism has still come back from time to time, a bit like a zombie. Well, we have a great group of speakers today, and they'll talk about many aspects of the Kerry administration and the man himself. Now, understandably, a lot of the recent talk about Hugh Carey has been about his role as a manager of the fiscal crisis and as a governor who brought fiscal discipline to the state and the city. Well, to be sure, if all Hugh Carey had done was to save the city and the state from the fiscal problems of the mid-1970s, he would still rank as one of our greatest governors. But Governor Carey was not just a fiscal disciplinarian. He believed deeply in the role of the states and the federal system to solve the great problems facing the country. And he wanted to bring fiscal discipline to government, not to shrink its role, but to ensure that it could meet future as well as current needs. Indeed, there were many examples of how Governor Kerry used state government to deal with critical social and economic problems. He had a deep personal commitment to people with disabilities, as Jim and Trone will speak about today. He built one of the nation's most impressive environmental records, including the 1976 enactment of the historic State Environmental Quality Review Act. He brought the City University of New York under state leadership so that the New York has state-supported public higher education in its largest city as well as outside it. And he was largely responsible for making sure that the downstate mass transit system was strong and vital for another generation. Now, unlike many people in Washington and elsewhere who now profess support for greater fiscal discipline in government, there was no anti-government rhetoric in Hugh Carey's speeches or record. He respected and protected government. That respect came through in an opening essay in a book published by the Rockefeller Institute in 1985, where Governor Carey wrote that early in his administration, he rejected the advice of some of his, his advisors to take what he called the wailing wall and crying towel approach. That is, to underscore the gravity of the fiscal situation and then use all possible resources to place the blame where it belonged, mostly, of course, on his predecessors. But he said he rejected that idea of blaming his predecessors in part because he didn't want to waste any time or energy that might be used to actually fix the problems. But in a comment that I thought revealed a lot about the man, he also rejected this approach because he thought that the nation in New York had already had a full diet of Watergate, and that dwelling on the failures and mistakes of his predecessors would just generate more skepticism and cynicism among the people of New York. Now, this defense of government was a, as a precious yet sometimes fragile instrument for doing good was, as I read it, a recurrent theme in his life. He was a classic member of the greatest generation and an experienced defender of our country and our institutions. As many of you know, Hugh Carey enlisted in the US Army before World War II even began. 
and rose through the ranks in combat leadership. But what some of you may not know is that as the army was driving into Germany, Hugh Carey came down with appendicitis and was pulled behind the lines and admitted to a hospital in Paris, where he was supposed to stay for a week after the operation. But instead, the morning after the operation, he left the hospital and hitchhiked back to his unit at the front lines. This dogged persistence, his belief in the potential of our public and private institutions to do good, especially when they work together and across party lines, and his clear-eyed, pragmatic view of our economic and social problems all constitute a great legacy that should inspire all of us. And I'm very thankful that we can come together today and honor that legacy and that man. We have a wonderfully rich program this afternoon. We will begin with a brief introduction from Governor Kerry's son, Michael Kerry, who will also introduce our main speaker. After our speaker's remarks, we have a superb panel of expert discussants who will talk about the Kerry administration's legacy, uh, plus anything else they want to say, actually. Uh, then we will have a special presentation for a very special book about Governor Kerry and we will finish with comments from another member of the large and fascinating Carey family. But to start off, we have Michael Carey. Michael is principal of the Carey Group LLC, which specializes in real estate development and government relations. He has also had a distinguished career of public service. He played key roles in the administrations of Mayor Michael Bloomberg and former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. He was president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation from 1999 to 2002, and before that, the agency's executive vice president and general counsel. In those positions, he oversaw numerous projects, including restoration of the Brooklyn Army Terminal and a variety of projects relating to the revitalization of 42nd Street. He serves as a trustee of the Educational Construction Fund and as a director of Tomorrow's Hope Foundation and New York Convention Center Development Corporation. He's a graduate of the Catholic University of America and the Fordham University School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Michael Carey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was a whole lot more than I expected, but thank you very much. We want to say thank you on behalf of my family uh, for doing this. Um, Thank you to the Rockefeller Institute, and uh, I think that um, you know, we are up here today, I should just say, because the cathedral was nice enough to have a mass for my father, um, which we were all at this morning, and uh, it was a terrific turnout. And I'd like to say a few words about my father and then introduce Peter Goldmark. Um, I think um, back in 1975, on January 1st, we had the mass at the, Immaculate, at the Cathedral of Immaculate Conception, my father first took office. And for those of you who were around then, he started off the first state of the state by saying that the, I'm sorry. He asked me to use the microphone. Oh, okay, sorry. By saying that the days of wine and roses are over. What he didn't say that publicly, although it was said at the time, was that Governor Rockefeller had the champagne and I got the hangover. And so it began. Uh, you know, I think uh, as, as my, my predecessor just said, he had no interest in blaming the previous administration. In fact, he saw it as we just have to move forward and get things fixed and, and do it in a hurry. And I think it's very appropriate that we have today here, you know, Peter Goldmark, who was the budget director back then, and Jim Introne, who was one of the architects of the sort of health care policies that, uh, that were um, born and, um, and grown out of my father's administration. I think just to, to put things into context, uh, we often refer to my father as the huge. Uh, that might be because he had 14 children. Uh, it could also be because he had a huge war career in which he enlisted in the infantry and then went on to become a full colonel in the infantry and was the first American officer into Nordhausen concentration camp. Or perhaps it was because he served 14 years in Congress, during which time he authored several key um, uh, articles of legislation on education, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or on civil rights legislation where he worked with the Johnson administration. Or you could say it was because of the physical crisis and all that was done to bring together talented people to avert the bankruptcy of New York. Um, all of those things are perhaps because he felt right at home singing along with Frank Sinatra or Dinah Shore or laughing with Bob Hope 
as he did with, with basically talking to the corner uh, newsman or to be in the company of presidents or kings. My father was the real deal, and I often like to say, for those of you who saw the movie Last Hurrah, he was Spencer Tracy um, through and through. And for those of you who know of Judy Garland, that was my mother. My mother was my father's Judy Garland. And, you know, he left us on August 7th. My mother's birthday was September 7th. And I like to say to my sister Helen, I think he just wanted to be on hand for mommy's birthday, you know, the other Helen, that is. So I mention that because, you know, there are 14 of us, and basically my father and mother did a fantastic job of giving us a start in life. And my father had the burden of not only running the state government, but also of overseeing, you know, 14, at that time, 12 children going in different directions. Um, we lost two brothers back in 1969, and then we lost Paul, so we salute them also as, as we stand here today. Um, but, you know, when my father left office, the New York Times commented that he was the governor for hard time, hard winters, that is. And I think that just to, to marry the two principles that I like to speak of, one, he's no question known best for, the, for his efforts with respect to the fiscal crisis, but... There is a picture out in Shelter Island where my family spends most summers of a drawing of my father in, in combat garb, and he's holding the Willowbrook consent decree in his hand. And I think it perhaps tells a great, great message about how, despite the troubles that New York had, despite the challenges that New York had, you know, we never forgot the underprivileged or those among us who basically are in need of assistance or protection, whether it be those that were at Willowbrook or de developmentally disabled at other places. He was a champion of those people. And I think it is a great testament to his years in office that New York was able to do more with less, but never turned its back on the underprivileged in our society. Um, you know, uh, not that Seymour Lackman needs any promotion, but many of you probably know that during the last, winter, last uh, year's gubernatorial campaign, our current governor, Andrew Cuomo, was fond of giving the book out the governor who saved New York. And I think he did it to giving it to union leaders and to legislators, trying to give them the sense that this is the type of governance that, that he thought was appropriate for Albany. So I think he's doing a great job because I think he's, he's, he's seeing some of those lessons and acting on them. But um, I think we have a great group of panelists today. And I'm very pleased with that to say, Peter Goldmark, can you come up here? Peter was the budget director in my father's administration. And throughout the last 25 years, my father was never shy about giving Peter credit for the, for the role that he played in terms of the physical crisis. Uh, Peter's gone on to have a wonderful, wonderful career as, as among other things, editor of the Paris Tribune. And uh, I think he was only about 10 years old when my father came into office. Judging Peter's only 42 now, right? <laughs> Peter, thank you, buddy. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, and I'm just going to cover it very fast. Sometimes I'll be light, sometimes I'll be very serious. I'm going to go by a lot of doors that I point out, but won't have time to go through them. But if you want to go through them, the panel will take you through them, or you can do so in questions. Edward R. Murrow once said about President Roosevelt that he was the most unaccountable president that our country had ever had. By that, he did not mean that Franklin Roosevelt was not responsive to the people who elected him. He didn't mean that Franklin Roosevelt had no sense of accountability. What he meant was that Franklin Roosevelt did not fit into the normal categories of political animals and public life. And in that sense, Hugh Carey was the most unaccountable governor this state has ever had and one of the great figures of the second half of the 20th century. Michael said something very important. He mentioned the Willowbrick Consent Decree. What is interesting about that decree, which is essentially an act of liberation, is it was done in the middle of the fiscal crisis. That governor brought time and focus to that when the city was burning and we hadn't yet figured our way out. In the middle of it, not afterwards. Hugh Carey was not an ideologue, he was a humanitarian. 
Now, I thought there was going to be a smaller group, and I did up a little sheet of paper. You know how in the silent movies they used to have to give you a, a headline in black and white to tell you what was happening next because there were no words? You couldn't tell. So I did up a bunch of headings here. We're not going to do them all, but I want you to hear them. The hole in the ejection, that's when we uh, measure how deep the fiscal hole of New York City was, and the governor throws me out of his office for recommending that the state take over city finances. We got there. He says, Peter, oh, those beetle brows came down, and he says, Peter, you're forgetting the fundamental rule of New York politics. The governor doesn't interfere with the mayor. That's where we started. <laughs> My second one is called Abe Goes to the White House, and I don't mean Lincoln. I may tell you that one briefly. It was, it was hysterical, and it was my first, it, it wasn't my first visit to the White House, but it was my first visit to the White House for a working meeting with a president, as opposed to a party or, or, uh, or a ceremonial occasion. So, first of all, the governor is standing around waiting for President Ford to come into the meeting and there are Ford's aides and our aides and I want you to remember that these two congressmen had the following things in common. They had served in Congress together, they had swapped votes, beers, stories, they were on opposite uh, sides of the aisle and everybody was sure in both cases that neither of them would ever amount to anything. <laughs> So Kerry is waiting around, we're all waiting, and in comes Gerald Ford, and a strange look passed between these two men who knew each other, but it was a puzzled look, and it took me a second, and then they got it. Each one was thinking, how did that guy get in that job? <laughs> so there we are around the table, and A. Beam presents the case for the city of New York. Saints save us. <laughs> And he winds up, Ford is rolling his eyes because he's going on and on, the governor's fidgeting. And uh, first of all, we're at the table uh, in the cabinet room, I guess it is, and, and a chin comes up to about here. And uh, he's going on and on and he's explaining, you know, Ford asks him why is the subway fare only 35 cents? We're going, and finally Ford, doesn't know, he's reading through his briefing book, he says, and Mr. Mayor, I mean Abe, why is there free tuition at City University? And A. Beam launches into this long explanation, which concludes, this is almost a verbatim quote, and so, Mr. President, if it weren't for free tuition at City University, I wouldn't be here with you today. <laughs> Total hush falls over the room. We have a couple of other high moments in that meeting, you know. Ford clearly doesn't understand what's wrong with the city of New York. Hugh Carey, with his mind, has it all taped, uh, explains it lucidly and briefly, and then Ford goes around the table. He clearly doesn't know what to do. He's relatively new in the job. So he goes around the table and he, has, he says, points to somebody sitting the opposite side and says, opposite side of the table, he says, well, do you know how all this happened? And the voice rings out. Well, Mr. President, no, I don't know how all this happened. This is Governor Nelson Rockefeller. <laughs> he goes on down the line, says, what about you, Bill? And Bill says, well, Mr. President, absolutely inexplicable. A fix it was Bill Simon, Secretary of the Treasury, who had been, let us remember, Jim remembers, the chairman of Controller Beam's Debt Advisory Committee. They were turning this stuff out like pancakes. So Ford is really baffled by it. Anyway, that was going to be the story of Abe goes to the White House. <laughs> Mac and the control board, I'm not going to take you through the history of that. Seymour and others have recounted it very well. I do want you to think of them together. All the history books say Mac passed in late May or early June, not sure, and then the control board in September. They were together. We weren't that dumb. We knew you had to have them together. Stanley Stein got wouldn't pass the control board because Bean told him not to. But they were part of, the, part of the same conception. And it's in that cycle that Hugh Carey begins the amazing, wonderful job of pulling on talent from all over the firmament, the New York firmament, the national firmament. <clears throat> it's during those months, actually starting in late April and early May, when with David Burke's help, David Burke, probably the unsung hero of this whole story, um, they draw in people like Felix, Smiley, Ellinghouse, Judge Rifkin, and then we go on to the first board. Remember Herb Ellish. How many people know who Herb Ellish is? 
couple. First executive director of MAC. Doesn't strut, he's still around. He's the one who negotiated on behalf of the governor the wage givebacks with the New York City unions. Wow, you want to talk about a tough job. But that is the area in which the talent comes in and the structure is put in place. Legacy, this is supposed to be about legacy a little bit. Just a word, a door for you to think about after we leave. We are going to need some more control boards before this decade is over in the public sector, in this state and in this country. And what we will need at the national level is a workout process. I'm not going to call it a control, but a workout process with discipline. And we are probably going to be in a situation where some states will have to go through it. And many of you in the room know there is no process in this country now today by which a state can go bankrupt. But there are several of our states, some of our largest states, who are either today functionally equivalent to bankruptcy or very, very close to it. So we haven't built that mechanism yet. It can be built. The country's not ready for it. But it can be built, and it will have to be built. And back the control board will not be a bad model on which to start. Resizing the New York public sector. We had to cut both budgets. There were days, as my wife reminds me, when I would work in the Capitol during the day, I'd get on the state plane and go down and run the city's budget at night and then come back up the next morning. We just went through a series of cuts in New York State. We will at some point probably have to go more. But the lessons of that are, number one, it is one system, folks. It is one nervous system. The people in the nursing homes are patients and human beings. The students in the schools are single, authentic individuals. And you can't cut the state budget without at the same time looking at the county and the local government budgets. And we have come close to that a couple of times. Now, we had a map that nobody ever saw other than the governor. Of you. We had a map. And it was called a single nervous system map, which is how all these systems interrelated, both in terms of their financing and in terms of their beneficiaries. You have to go after that stuff if you're resizing the government because, as is the case now, two-thirds to three-quarters of all the expenditures in the public realm in the New York family of governments are in the area of health, education, and welfare. And that figure still holds true. But you have to go at them together not separately. You cannot simply cut one budget and create a tsunami or a ripple that goes and affects the other budget. It can be done. It, in fact, is the more intelligent and the more humane way to do it. The other thing is make the institutions carry the burden and the heat, not the individuals or the families. Now, that's easier said than done, and that's an imperfect art, but that is the goal, and that was Hugh Carey's goal, believe me. By that, I mean in Medicaid, for example, we did not close down specific services, which would have meant anybody who needed that service couldn't get it. We didn't. There's a word for it. I forget whether it's to, when you make a certain range of services ineligible for a certain category of the population. We ran the voltage through the institutions, through the nursing homes, through the hospitals. We gave them incentives to shrink systemically, and we gave them disincentives to either lay people off or throw patients out on the street. Now, it was not perfect, but we did manage to get most of those cuts to be made by the institutions at their own pace. And it can be done again. And now we have to do that as a whole country. We are, the health care costs in this country are escalating far faster than we can afford. And the sooner we start that, the better. But again, it's got to be a whole system altogether. We'll skip the midnight roundup. It was terrific. <laughs> um, that was the night the legislature didn't pass one of the bailout bills for the state HFA, Housing Finance Authority. I don't know where the governor was. Uh, nobody else was in the Capitol except me, and they came down and told me at 2 a.m., legislature passed nine bills, but not the 10th. That meant technically the next morning the HFA would be in default. So my trusted assistant, Katie McKay, tells me I waited 10 seconds. Count them. One, two, and then I got on the phone, 
told the Capitol Police to lock the Capitol. I told the state police to go to every exit on the thruway and turn back any legislator who arrived. I, this is all laid out in the Constitution, you know, that the <laughs> budget director can do this. And then I assembled my staff and I said, every bar in Albany, want every legislator back in. <laughs> oh, that's where most of them were. They weren't on the thruway. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, at 5 a.m. that morning, Stanley Steingut, who grasped more or less what was going on, <laughs> called the uh, assembly to order, banged his gavel, said how many votes for Bill, whatever it was. And ladies and gentlemen, there were 76 human beings in the seat of the, that assembly chamber at 5 a.m. I don't know to this day how many of them were assembly people, but there was... <laughs> Cavalry to the rescue. Hugh Carey's biggest gamble, Seymour knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's fall. The feds aren't ready to act. MAC is over because the markets are closed to MAC. We're beginning the cuts, but there isn't enough money to finance the city. What does Hugh Carey do? He's already made it clear that the fate of the city and the state are intertwined. He now lashes the fate of the state to that of the city. He asked the legislature to appropriate three first instance appropriations. Don't worry about what that means. Three advances of $750 million each to the city of New York. And this is called among us the bridge to nowhere because there was no visible means of repayment. It was a supreme and single act of greatest courage, the loneliest act, I think it was more dangerous than most people understood at the time. I had real doubts. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I went upstairs saying, oh, governor, let's ship two and a quarter million billion dollars to New York City. History affirmed it. The gamble paid off, but that was the darkest, loneliest hour. Because if it hadn't worked out, that meant we were all going down very, very far. Cavalry to the rescue, political guts, absolute determination, just like getting out of that hospital bed and going back to the front. And history redeemed it. The magic window, we'll skip that. The great rollover, we'll skip that. I'll uh, just say a wor few words about uh, how I see the Carey legacy. Again, I started by saying he was not an ideologue, he was a humanitarian. And he would really stand out today because we've got a lot of ideologues on the scene. Not Hugh Carey. He was pragmatic, he was innovative, and he cared about the least vulnerable among us. What was the legacy? Grit. I've never met a person in public life with the amount of grit that he had. Just bear down and get through it. Compassion. He really understood what individual human beings who were not fortunate went through. And he cared about that. And he cared about that from the heart. It wasn't only from the head. Now those first two things, grit and compassion, you just take a second later today and ask yourself how many people in public life you know who have both of those, grit and compassion. I'm not saying he was always easy to work for. <laughs> Grit and compassion, generosity toward the most vulnerable, real generosity. Generosity not in the sense of a handout, generosity in the sense if you have it, you should share it. If somebody's willing to work hard, they should have a chance. And not afraid to wear that generosity in his sleeve in public life. Sharing the credit. Every, all of you know that. Um, he had a lot of big people on the stage with him, and he shared the credit. And that was key to working with the legislature. Um, it was key to working with the federal government. But at the same time that he shared the credit, he did his political homework with Melvin Laird, um, with Lud Ashley. I don't know how many of you remember his name. A story I never heard at the time that Seymour and his partner Rob Polner uncovered, which is the great conversations with Mayor Daley. Uh, who had up until that time been convinced somehow by the Illinois banks that the best thing would be if the New York banks had a lot of trouble. 
And one Irishman to another, one American politician to another, they sat down and they got that one straightened out. So he did his political homework, but he shared the credit. And then the trademark of all the great leaders, I'm reading a new biography of Winston Churchill at the moment, the trademark of all the great, our great political leaders, the worse the pressure gets, the stronger they get. And I don't know where that comes from. It comes from God or inside or both, but that was Hugh Carey. So thanks for letting me share a few thoughts, and I think I give this back to Tom. Is that right? Uh, actually, if there's any, does anybody have a question? We can entertain one or two questions before we begin. Do you want to start with this? Anybody? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we can go on with the um, with our panel. All right. I'll ask our panelists to come up with this. So, <laughs> well, we have three wonderful panelists uh, to talk about the legacy of uh, the governor. Uh, James Entrone has served four New York governors. He was Deputy Director of the Division of the Budget, Commissioner of the Office of Mental Retardation and Developmental Disabilities, Director of State Operations for Governor Carey, and more recently, Deputy Secretary for Health and Director of Healthcare Redesign for Governor Andrew Cuomo. He was a key player in the Carey administration's work on a variety of major issues, including addressing trouble conditions at Willowbrook and other state institutions for the developmentally disabled. Before joining the Cuomo administration, Jim Entrone was president and CEO, CEO of ArchCare, the Catholic health care system of the Archdiocese of New York. He also served as president of Loretto, the largest provider of comprehensive services to elderly individuals in central New York. He was executive director of United Cerebral Palsy Association and has served on the board of numerous organizations dedicated to the care of the aging and individuals with disabilities. So thank you very much, Jim, for coming. Now, it's always a delight to have Gerald Benjamin back at the Rockefeller Institute, where he's led and, and been involved in projects for more than 25 years. Among his many contributions, Jerry co-edited Making Experience Count, Managing Modern New York in the Cary Era, published by the Rockefeller Institute in 1985. We're proud of this book, which includes interviews with the governor as well as eight of the individuals helps establish the Cary record. Jerry served the Institute as director of the Center for the New York State and Local Government Studies, and he was research director of the Temporary State Commission on Constitutional Revision, appointed by Governor Mario Cuomo in the mid-1990s. Earlier, he was principal research advisor to a New York City Charter Revision Commission that achieved the most extensive structural changes in the government of that city in recent history. Jerry has served in New York State, served New York State in many other capacities, including several years as chairman of the legislature and chief elected officer of Ulster County. He is one of SUNY's most highly regarded scholars, having been named a distinguished professor by the SUNY Board of Trustees in 2002, and perhaps one of his most extraordinary achievements, Professor Benjamin somehow preserved his sanity um, at least so far as I can tell. After several years as Dean of Faculty at the College of New Paltz. What is Jeffy, his view? <laughs> um, maybe you can make a, a brief assessment after, the, uh, after this session, Jerry. And he is currently Associate Vice President for Regional Engagement and Director of the Center for Research, Regional Education, and Outreach at SUNY New Paltz. Finally, our panel includes E.J. McMahon, Senior Fellow at Manhattan Institute's Empire Center for New York State Policy. Now, E.J. is one of the most widely quoted analysts in New York State 
fiscal policy, not so much because he has a point of view, although he definitely does, um, but because he's also, he is definitely one of the most knowledgeable observers of the field. His policy influence was felt most directly earlier this year when Governor Cuomo persuaded the legislature to enact a tight cap on local property taxes, an idea and proposal that EJ developed in advance several years ago. But his policy influence is nothing new. In the early 1990s, he drafted a personal income tax reform plan that became the basis for tax cuts enacted under Governor Pataki. And he developed the template for the school report cards that the Board of Regents now requires of every school in New York. Among EJ's many positions over the years, he served as deputy commissioner in the State Department of Taxation and Finance and as vice chancellor of the State University of New York. Now we'll have brief presentations from each of our panelists and then some time for discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. So I think we'll start with uh, Jim and then uh, go on uh, to Jerry and, uh, and EJ. I have instructions here. Son, does that work? Oh, great. Okay, I joined the um, Kerry administration and I think it was February of 1975. Um, January, February. I had worked for Bob Morgado previously, uh, and uh, when Bob joined, he brought me along with him. I stayed until I think it was September of 1982. So, had a number of different jobs, but it always seemed to me like I had one job. I just sat in different places, was called different things, but it was always one job working for the uh, working for the governor. In some sense, it was the job nobody wanted. Uh, when Peter was out running around trying to save New York City, I was running around trying to save Yonkers. <laughs> uh, so, you know, so I, had, I had Yonkers and Buffalo in my portfolio. Peter had New York City. Um, I, was the, I always seemed to get myself involved in the situations nobody else wanted. I, one of my, the highlights of my career was in Dick Hongisto. I can't remember what was wrong with Dick Hongisto, but he, former mayor of uh, San Francisco is going to be corrections commissioner. It didn't last for uh, not very long. So this is, this is just before the election. We were going into the election without a corrections commissioner. Or it was just around the election. And uh, so they got my job. What are we going to do about replacing Dick Hongisto, which is the way Tom Coughlin got to be, by the way, corrections commissioner. Tommy was a, uh, he was a state trooper. Uh, we found Tom up in it's another one of my jobs. I was an advanced guy for a little while. I had previously worked uh, for Bob Kennedy as an in in internship, and my boss was Jerry Bruno, who was the advanced guy. Um, and uh, when I got to uh, the governor's office, uh, Jerry was there as, as running the lottery, and he needed somebody to work with him on advance so we could get through the governor's trips around the state. I went up to um, one of the trips. Uh, I was going up to Watertown and uh, trying to find out what to do in Watertown, everybody said to me, don't go see that guy who runs the Association for Retarded Children up there, because he's a troublemaker. And so naturally, I went to see him. And um, <laughs> turned out to be, I found this uh, blue-eyed Irish guy, a former uh, state trooper, uh, running this, uh, the center up in, uh, in Watertown. And one thing um, led to another, and, and he became uh, the first commissioner of, uh, of mental retardation. But, but Tommy was always a, uh, a cop. And he, he said to me the first day he came down to Albany, he said, you know, what I really want to be is the head of state police. So when uh, I remembered that, he said he wanted, he wanted, because he didn't have a good career with the state police. And he wanted to be the head of state police. So when Hangisto left, I, I went, when we were looking for somebody, I went to Tommy, I said, yeah, I can get you a badge. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the state police. Anyway, he wound up to be a great, uh, great corrections uh, commissioner. And, and, and Tom Coughlin, by the way, what the, talk about people in the Kerry administration doesn't get enough credit for being one of the most brilliant managers of very two complex uh, systems uh, over the course of, of many, uh, many, many years. But the heart of my involvement with the Kerry administration was with um, uh, disability services, healthcare and disability services. Now that I've reached this age, I can say, and I love to say, so I've been around a long time, I say, so, and I've known a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of government. And it's, it's interesting. Peter is absolutely correct. Most of government is about human services and education, social services, healthcare. But it's rare to find leaders in government who viscerally 
connect with those issues. Uh, most of the people, when I look over the course of my career and know the people, elected officials in the legislature, governors, um, many with good values, many well-intentioned, the, the thing that really gets them interested in government are transportation or uh, in, environmental conservation or tax policy or the structure of government. Hugh Carey was one of those really rare individuals. I think at the core of him, viscerally, the thing that was just most important to him, although he obviously all the kudos on the New York City bailout and saving New York City and saving New York State, uh, all of that is a uh, you know, remar remarkable set of accomplishments. But at his core, it was about people and it was about human services. So while well, in some days I thought I'd had the worst job in Albany, most of the time I thought I had the best job because I was his health and disabilities guy. And I could do just about anything. As long as I could convince him it, uh, we could pay for it and it was good for people, uh, we just got away with murder. I, uh, I was persona non grata in budget division. I, they did not like to see me coming because they know it was going to be about spending a little bit more money. But actually, uh, we managed to uh, put together what I think is a remarkable, remarkable record. And I did want to mention, I, I think if I look back on those years, the four achievements that I would, uh, I would touch upon as the most important in the human service area was, and nobody knows this, nobody remembers this, it was uh, uh, Chapter 853, Law 76, was, was the reform of the handicapped education law. It had been years and years before that section of law had been touched. And uh, although most of the attention was paid to the handicap for, the Education for All Handicapped Kids, which was a 1975 federal statute, the reform in, in 1976 uh, uh, of New York system was critical, and it's the system that is in place today. We did Willowbrook, after Peter got done negotiating that fine document. A bunch of us were left to try and figure out how to implement it, which was uh, not easy given, uh, I mean, I think the document was uh, inspirational, but there were, uh, as a working document, it had some flaws in it. And then we had a 90-year-old judge, Judge John J. Bartels, that we had to contend with. It was certainly interesting, but Willowbrook obviously stands as, as one of his great, great achievements. We began, for the first time, healthcare cost containment. Uh, Medicaid uh, came into being 1966, but it was basically an opportunity to spend money up until 1976 with chapter 19, chapter 76, the laws of 76, and then 77 of, of 1977, we began really the era of cost containment. And finally, the creation of the Council on Children and Families, uh, which was the beginning of an attempt, and I, I'm not sure we ever really succeeded in trying to pull together all the state services that, that benefited children and, and try and develop a more comprehensive, cohesive set of policies. We began that effort, but it just frankly ran out of time uh, before we could give it done. But a remarkable, I think a remarkable uh, set of uh, accomplishments for a, a governor known for his fiscal acumen and, and, and fiscal process. And of course, just a, a, a touch on Willowbrook. I, I think people, they use the word Willowbrook, they say Willowbrook. It's just really hard to understand what, uh, uh, what that meant, how significant it was in the lives of individuals, and how difficult the implementation of that uh, consent decree was. First, it was a question of money. Where were we going to get the money in a time of uh, financial distress? Fortunately, we found a way to medicate a lot of services, and if it wasn't for that, it wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't have been done. And some remarkable individuals contributed to that, finding a way to lead the nation in applying Medicaid funds to those services. People uh, talk about Willowbrook, but you know many of the families um, were very happy with their kids in uh, the state institutions, and the insecurity of knowing we we're going to close those institutions, move people into the community. It was tough for families, and we had to do a lot of talking uh, to get by that. And there were the unions. A lot of jobs tied up in providing services to 23,000 people living in institutions, and the unions were very threatened uh, by the idea of deinstitutionalization. A lot of conversations uh, went into that. 
it was a major, major undertaking. We had to reorganize departmental hygiene in order to make it happen. Uh, put together a whole new industry out there of voluntary agencies providing services to people in the community. All of it was done, and by the time we left, uh, the structure was in place. And today we're looking at, what, a uh, thousand people still remaining in those uh, state institutions. It was a great opportunity for a 30-year-old kid, didn't know really very much about state government. I enjoyed it. At the end of the day, you know, Hugh Carey was the kind of guy who was not a taskmaster. You did, you worked for him because you loved him, because of what he, just because of what he stood for, because he was inspirational and he was so talented. Uh, you know, we were all in awe for his uh, talent. Talent, not maybe the great greatest manager in the world, but the greatest leader I think that I've ever encountered. And it was a privilege, to, and I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be at this point where people are finally paying some attention to the record of this guy, and. Um, compliment the Rockefeller Institute for giving us the opportunity to talk about him a little bit. Well, I'm uh, either advantage or disadvantage in this forum in that I, I, I didn't know Hugh Carey very well at all. Uh, and both of my, both of the personal account uh, encounters I recall. I'm going to stand up because I'm just much more comfortable and professorial, I guess. <laughs> my uh, were fraught. The first encounter was one day when I was sitting in my. I recall this very, very careful, uh, very, very de detailed way. I was sitting in my office at SUNY Newport's. Uh, the phone rang, and I had just given a comment to the New York Times about what I can barely recall is some shortcoming or limitation in the way the state was being governed, which is my won't. And uh, the guy at the other side of the phone said, Professor Benjamin, this is you, Carey. And I said, Shartok, stop screwing around. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, Professor, this is the governor. And he engaged me in, uh, in my uh, uh, misunderstanding of his, uh, the way he was approaching the particular matter. The other occasion came in connection with this book, which was written as a book to ease the transition uh, from the Carey to the Cuomo administration by establishing the record. We observed that uh, most of the transitional time was, been, was spent in shredding documents. And we thought perhaps <laughs> Documenting the record might be a good idea. And of course, Governor Carey, not mentioned here yet, uh, decided to leave office. And uh, so he knew that he would have a transition and he wanted to document the transition. And his commissioners and other uh, aides uh, were interested in that too. So uh, we arranged, Warren Ilchman, who is the director here, and I arranged to uh, do these interviews and, uh, and interview the governor. And I prepared assiduously as uh, interviewing governors was not then, nor is it now a, a, an experience I have on a daily basis, and, and uh, uh, wrote out my questions and prepared. And we went to New York. He was in a law firm, as I recall at that time, and put a tape recorder on the desk and asked him a series of questions. Uh, one thing not mentioned, by the way, is his extraordinary wit. There's a difference between wit and a sense of humor. He, I never encountered him telling a joke, but his quickness and his capacity to see the sometimes the absurd, the sometimes the humorous, sometimes the a positive, a positive in the in the moment was was. Uh, I admire that above almost any other characteristic having to do with personality. Anyway, so we interviewed him. It was very serious. At one moment, I asked him. He's probably used this line more than once. I said, "You know, the uh, your second term was less distinguished than the first, Governor. Uh, how would you characterize your record in the second term?" And he turned to me and said, "Professor, what do you want me to do? Save New York City twice?" <laughs> <laughs> but but in any uh, in any uh, case he uh, so we left and uh, I picked up the tape recorder uh, we went to uh, another place maybe a coffee shop and Warren said well let's hear what he had to say and I turned it on and realized that it hadn't been running <laughs> <laughs> so we had this uh, several hour interview with the governor with no record 
So I reconstructed the best I could the record of the interview and uh, submitted it to the governor for his consideration. As, you, as those of you who've seen this book, which is far less distinguished than the book we're honoring today, but those of you who've seen it uh, know that he uh, uh, talked about his governorship and uh, also we include some of that interview. So we captured enough of it, mainly based on uh, fear and terror, <laughs> to allow us to proceed. Now I'm going to, uh, so I, uh, I comment as an academic and with some experience in government and I, uh, uh, and, and I uh, um, uh, endorse all that was said uh, about the governor. He was an extraordinary leader. I, uh, I'm very fond of a quotation from uh, uh, 12th Night, Malvolio, be not afraid of greatness. Some men are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them, uh, or so, sometimes dismissed as a formula for greatness because of the play being a comedy rather than a history play. But uh, Carey was, Hugh Carey had greatness thrust upon him, you might say. You know, he was put in a circumstance where, where he had a, a life or death circumstance for New York. But he was not afraid. He was not afraid. He had the capacity to lead in the most critical moment and, in, I th I'd say, embrace the opportunity to lead. And others won't say it, and I know it may be sensitive, but also in a time where his personal life was not untroubled, was not roiled by, other, by considerations of family and tragedy. And so the, and those of you, I'm sure uh, mature people have all had difficulties in their lives, but uh, ascending to that, ascending to that Responding to that circumstance uh, is, is almost a definition of character in a time of ex personal as well as professional challenge. Um, this book uh, comments, it was written and was published after the first two years of the Cuomo administration and noted that the, uh, the comparisons were invidious for Carrie. Uh, we placed great, academics placed great emphasis on timely budgets. And uh, this reminded me of the need for perspective, you know, the perspective of time and experience. <laughs> As we now, exp we now understand uh, Hugh Carey's achievements. Uh, and, 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 the com and we have a greater capacity for comparison and, uh, and as, as, the, as the alternative points of comparison rise and perform, we understand that we were especially privileged uh, in that in that time, in the time of the Kerry governorship. Let me uh, uh, let me comment about uh, three things, and, re and uh, this I know this is not a reading, and Tom Gase gave me a time limit, which is very wise. <laughs> but but uh, uh, one or two things are interesting. First, on the question of the crisis, uh, and this I guess has been. Uh, been sufficiently uh, commented upon. But the governor listed what he faced in his essay in this book. The state budget gap of 700 million, the bailout of insolvent state agencies, the illiquidity and near bankruptcy of New York City, Yonkers, and Buffalo, the mass transit deficit and decline, something that hasn't been discussed today, but was so challenging that Dick Ravage came along and engaged with uh, um, in, in such, that, that elevated his reputation and role. The Heard and Levittown problems in education, double-digit unemployment and the flight of industry, the highest taxes in the nation, and the failure of state service agencies uh, to work. That was his list. Uh, Willowbrook was mentioned. I asked him, Governor, wasn't it terribly difficult to, uh, to have to deal with Willowbrook in the midst of this? Wasn't it a burden? And he said, no, Professor. It was a great opportunity to do something that I wanted to do. So interesting to me, you know, the external analytic perspective being so wrong, you know, so wrong about the priorities of the, of the leader. Um, the other, another couple of points, I, I, you know, Hugh Carey wasn't well prepared to govern New York. He was a congressman. You know, if you think about where we've been recruiting, our, we recruit our, our governors from inside, the, the other governor ill-prepared in our recent history was Nelson Rockefeller. <laughs> you think about it. You know, he had been a sanitary district commissioner in Westchester as his only elected office. So Hugh Carey was better prepared 
the Nelson Rockefeller. Another thing that's interesting is that the that the partisan loyalty of most people who knew about state government in 1974 was not Democrat. It was Republican. We had a Republican executive. We had a Republican legislature for most of that time. So some people who were recruited, uh, Bob Morgado was mentioned, I think, had experience on the Republican side and was recruited into the, into the government on both sides, actually, in the legislature. was And so this great, talented group of, 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 of people who, who, who joined with Kerry was recruited very widely, but was challenging at the beginning. I remember when, I, when he'd do press conferences and I was paying attention and he'd inevitably come to a question about some matter of public policy and he would say, Professor Shalala's looking after that. And I once asked Donna, you know, you must be a very broadly prepared person. <laughs> there are so many issues you're looking after. <laughs> It was almost a rote, a net response in the campaign transition before the government was assembled. Uh, two other points, legislative relations, uh, uh, and, uh, and Tom indulge me, I'm going to try to be as... Uh, so as, you know, the governor wrote about uh, uh, legislative relations And I'm, uh, and I'm quoting, I remember when I first moved into the Capitol, there was a series of three offices, but I was told that one I thought might be suitable for my needs did not have bulletproof glass windows. <laughs> when the legislative office building went up, Governor Rockefeller noticed that a sniper might take a shot at him from over there. <laughs> it's a reasonable concern. <laughs> That was not him. That was me. So, he, so he had bulletproof glass installed in the bigger rooms, but the third room was the one in which he met with the legislative leaders. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, go, uh, Governor Carey had, in Warren Anderson, a great partner because he was, he was able to transcend the parochial of his, parochialism of his circumstance less great partner in Stanley Steingut, but then followed with Stanley Fink, who, who, who is, I think, much, still much admired in Albany, certainly admired by me. But I think, uh, uh, and, he, and he was able to transcend partisanship by, uh, uh, by use of the crisis, and uh, Burke was qu quoted, and Burke made very clear his view that in the first two years, the crisis was the driver. It allowed things to happen. It impelled things to happen. But outside of the crisis, the governor didn't always have the highest regard for the legislature and its members. And in the second term, uh, he came to emphasize pursuing the values that he'd established for New York and breaking New York fiscally sound uh, in a time where he controlled the information. He pursued it into a time where he didn't control the alternative sources of information. And the legislature knew that some of the presentations he was making served his values, but might have not have been as accurate as they, as they could be in terms of what the, revenue proje the accurate re revenue projections were. And this became the driver of the, uh, of, the, of the vetoes and overrides late in his first term. And I think this had real important institutional consequences for New York and the condition of New York now and its legislative uh, executive relations that were only at least beginning to transcend or at least hoping to transcend based upon our most recent uh, experience. There's uh, more to say on this than I have time to say, but uh, I always am writing essays that end with what are the institutional consequences in the peak political institutions uh, of the legacy? And I think those for, for you carry the, the policy consequences, the policy priorities transcended the institutional consequences. You know, he wanted to make the point about what was necessary as a matter of policy, but didn't worry about whether the governorship or the legislature and that balance would be uh, prevail over the longer term, be strengthened or weakened over the longer term, or at least didn't seem to from my perspective. A third point, and then I'll, I'll stop. We hear a lot lately about staying on message, and we see a lot a lot of control, concern about control of message across state government. I've never seen in my recent, in my entire professional life, a circumstance where commissioners get sent out who are working on one subject to advance the administration's uh, priorities on another subject. This is, if not unique, very unusual to the current government. So the uh, 
DEC commissioner comes to uh, the Hudson Valley to advance the economic development agenda. And there's a credibility issue in that, in the, aud in the audience. Now, you carry, uh, when he apologized, uh, I asked him if he had anything to apologize for. He said, I apologize for my notorious bloopers uh, having to do with Burley and control it, trolling with him at the end of the line, having to do with drinking PCBs, having to do with uh, a dentist who lived on Shelter Island. So the, 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 the you know, and he, I think he genuinely re regretted that and regretted more the consequences for others than for himself. Uh, and there's a temptation to say that symbolic leadership is diminished when the governor does something like that. You know, when the governor's insensitive to the consequence of his casual remarks or his p personal behavior to the, to the leadership of the state. But they are, in fact, a reminder that the gover governor is human. He has life, he has experience, he has joys and sorrows, and maybe we'll say one day she has joys and sorrows and, and that give full de definition to a life. There's a life there, too. And uh, the, the, uh, in, a, in a time of, in a controlling time, uh, I think it becomes more attractive to me. Not perhaps every particular of these, of these, of these moments, these unplanned, spontaneous, and sometimes damaging moments for the, for the governance of New York, it becomes in a way attractive to me uh, that this can happen in a time where it is so unlikely to happen. Uh, after all, the governor said in summation of his essays, how many small boys have lived to see a governor like Alfred E. Smith as I did age seven and fulfill the dream of holding that office he held? Fifty years after seeing Governor Smith attend mass in Long Beach, I succeeded that great man and I did my best to be worthy of his memory. He, he said, I asked, maybe insensitively, what might your epitaph be, Governor? He said, perhaps they would put on the stone, he did his best and he had character. I think he did his best and he had character. Thank you. Good afternoon. That's a, those are tough acts to follow, but I'll, I'll do my best. I'm not sure if I'm on. Am I on? No? Okay. Well, I have this, I have this open mic right here. So. Um, I wouldn't be, uh, whoops, this is on. I wouldn't be too quick to assume that this is not the proper setting for uh, a conference dedicated to you, carry necessarily. Uh, as I think probably many people in this room can probably testify from personal experience, you, Carrie, and Nelson Rockefeller actually work quite closely together behind the scenes uh, during, as, as you, Carrie, became more senior in Congress and played a more important role on issues of importance to the state. Uh, in fact, uh, there were some who suggested that you, Carrie, if not Nelson Rockefeller's favorite member of Congress, was certainly one of his favorites. And they had a good working relationship, mutually respectful if not affectionate. Uh, and in fact, uh, Richard Reeves, uh, then of the Times, who covered the, the 1974 race, uh, suggested in a, in a big, long profile of Kerry right before the election, it's not every Democrat who can go through a campaign for governor without saying more than 10 bad words about a Republican who had just totally dominated a state for 15 years. The 10 bad words Kerry occasionally uses, by the way, are, Rockefeller spent our money as if we had his money. <laughs> In fact, it was noted in the earlier on how you, Kerry, um, had, had specifically declined to, to blame his predecessors for the problems he inherited. But I think he threw in enough zingers here and there, not the least of which was the days of wine and roses are over, to make clear that, uh, in fact, we had been on a bad path and we had to, to change. Another thing I've noted uh, in looking back on the history of this and in talking to people who were personally involved is right up to the point where you, Carrie, took office, how, and during the campaign in particular, was how little talk there was about uh, the problems that lie ahead. There was a growing awareness that the city had serious fiscal problems, but then again, if you, in context, the city always had serious fiscal problems. 
Uh, the national economy was a big concern. Inflation was beginning to rise. There was a v stagflation that set in, and unemployment had spiked. But you won't get a sense from, from any of the, the contemporaneous political coverage that there was a massive crisis waiting, and, and uh, we'd have to see if you, Kerry, was the man to handle that crisis. Uh, there was some suggestion of problems, to be sure, but the focus was mainly on how different you, Carry might be from what came before. And uh, one, one common place to look for the distilled conventional wisdom of the political and governing class in New York um, on, on the outlook for a particular administration is, of course, the New York Times piece on the day after the election, especially one that's written weeks in advance because there was little doubt as to who was going to win the election. And so Frank Lynn, many of you remember Frank Lynn, who was the Times political writer, main Times political writer at the time, uh, characterized you, Carey, uh, say, by saying his brand of liberalism is the bread and butter, New Deal, pro-labor liberalism of Kennedy, Humphrey, and Wagner, rather than the issue oriented liberalism of McGovern, McCarthy, or Ramsey Clark. And he went on to say that Carey is more of a pragmatist than an, ideolo than an ideologist. So that was pretty obvious at the time, and I think everyone agrees that that was, that that was the case. But then a lot of other things were, 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 in fact, again, not fully anticipating the severity of the challenge he faced. People got them wrong. So Frank Lynn said, on fiscal matters, he obviously leans to the traditional democratic tax philosophy of soak the rich and big business. And he predicted there would be tax increases, although not necessarily big ones, given how many Nelson Rockefeller had done. Now, that may have been you carry's natural leaning or default position coming into office. The irony is that's not where he ended up, which I'll get to in a moment. And then, for instance, to, to talk about an issue that's very current now, another issue on which Franklin speculated, and knowing Frank, Frank talked to a lot of people for this article, and this is what they, they told him. The moratorium on pension improvements for civil servants will almost certainly be ended as the price of strong support for Mr. Carey by many civil service unions. Well, in fact, the opposite occurred. The, the most significant pension reform in New York State's history was enacted under Hugh Carey, his second year in office. In fact, it was so significant it was undone a year after he left office, <laughs> thereby displaying the limits of changing the current system without restructuring it. So again, as many have observed, the governor came into office as, as a man determined, uh, who was ideally and uniquely suited to fixing the problems that he confronted and to doing what it was necessary, to doing what it took to, to fix this incredibly um, messed up fiscal situation that he inherited. Now, of course, my focus uh, is on, tends to be on tax and budget issues, and that's what I'll quickly focus on now, just a couple of statistics to give you an idea of the governor's record in just that area. Others have spoken about his record on social services and um, his overall, his humane approach to issues such as the Willowbrook closing, et cetera. So I'll talk about a couple of tax and spending numbers and close with a, a personal recollection. I, but I, I would also like to begin with an irony. You Carey uh, uh, was well acquainted and, and had totally absorbed the, the old Irish lesson, um, I think enunciated, often attributed to having been spoken out loud by John F. Kennedy, which is that life is not fair. And uh, certainly he, that had visited upon him in many ways, but also uh, he knew how to, he did not complain uh, or, or whine or, or go through any sort of, sort of you know, gratuitous um, attempts to defensively fix the record when, for instance, Malcolm Wilson, then governor, a member of the most profligate state administration in American history, bar none. You can check the record. I've even done it to prove it so I can say it safely. Unbelievable. Um, it ran against you, Carrie, calling him repeatedly a liberal big spender. Now, the fact that you, Carrie, was a member of a Congress, was, that was in fact true of you, Carrie given his voting record in, in the House of Representatives. But again, there was a, a delightful unconsciousness of irony on both sides. Also, um, the member of the administration that had been run by one of the richest men in America who had interlocking personal corporate interests that ran up and down and sideways through everything the state could be involved in was kept on the defensive throughout the campaign and made sure that he promised that his wealthy brother who was bankrolling his campaign would keep his affairs as transparent as Macy's window. <laughs> So these were the ironies in that campaign. But again, there, weren't, there wasn't that much talk about the fiscal situation. So the expectations were this is basically a Roosevelt uh, Kennedy labor liberal. Um, he tends to trend in that direction. We'll probably see some more tax increases. We won't be seeing as much spending because there's not as much money because the economy's bad. But, but we kind of know what we can expect from this guy. 
So what happened in the end? Well, actually, UCARI was, depending on how you measure it, probably the biggest tax cutter in New York's history. Uh, UCARI cut the marginal in income tax rate by 33%. George, Carey's uh, George Pataki's tax cut, which I had a role in authoring, cut the marginal tax rate by 13%. Mario Cuomo, by the way, cut it by 22%. So that's one statistic, but measure tax is another way. New York State's overall tax burden measured as a share of personal income was reduced 10% by UCARI at a time when in the rest of the country, as inflation pumped up incomes, the overall state tax burden was cut by about 2%. He, cuts, he held down the level of spending um, to a greater extent than any governor in New York's history. And here I have some statistics. Inflation adjusted, adjusting for inflation on an average annual basis, spending in the Rockefeller era, and actually the, the figures become comparable only in the second half of the Rockefeller-Wilson era. So the second um, two terms, the last two terms uh, of the Rockefeller-Wilson administration, spending increased after inflation, which was accelerating then, by an average of 4.5% a year. Now, under Governor Mario Cuomo, spending increased by an average after inflation of 2.6% a year. Pataki, 2.2%. Spitzer Patterson, 2.3%. You, you carry a microscopic 0.2%. Essentially, across the eight years of Governor Carey's administration, the state budget hardly grew at all. In real terms, it grew by about 1%. Uh, and that is remarkable, and no, no other state replicated that. And yet, during that period, the state took over responsibility for the court system and for the senior colleges of the City University of New York. Uh, a lot of remarkable things happened, not all of which were, were predictable at the outset of his tenure. You might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, where other things were happening? What did debt look like? Well, the state's debt relative to personal income and state and local debt relative to personal income also shrank, not greatly, but after expanding rapidly for decades, they shrank, and they shrank a little faster than the national average. And by the way, uh, getting into that common nervous system that Peter Goldmark talked about, the single nervous system of state and local governments, state and local tax burdens also declined as a share of personal income under UCARI. Now, we were number one in the nation when he took office, and we were still number one when he left office, but we went from about 40% above to about 20% above. Uh, basically, in other words, he was the, the needles were turned in the right direction in a, in a fairly big and significant way. And uh, it was, it's really remarkable when you look about it what a turnabout it was from the administration that preceded it. And did necessity force a lot of these changes on Governor Kerry? Yes, but he went beyond what necessity required. There was a corporate tax increase on big corporations, although at the same time, he negotiated with my former boss, Ray Schuler, a, a massive manufacturing investment tax credit that was enacted in the late 70s. He also went along with a proposal, and ultimately the governors need to get credit for these things, uh, an, uh, initiated by Stanley Fink <clears throat> that eliminated the state's uh, subchapter S tax on small businesses. These were significant improvements, and they helped bring about a, a national, a, an economic turnaround in New, in New York State, which did occur and until recently, which, uh, which was basically in, in the latest national recession, which was, we know was concentrated in western states and states with real estate bubbles, the, the most sustained period of growth in, economically in New York's history compared to the national average up to recent history was in the last four years of Governor, uh, uh, Governor Carey's ter term, Governor Carey's tenure. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but basically I think he arrested the slide in New York's prospects at that time. Now, as I said, I did I did not um, uh, work with directly with Governor Kerry, obviously, while he was governor. I was a report, young reporter. I think I covered some campaign events and some news conferences down in Westchester and Putnam counties where I first worked in the mid and late 70s. Uh, later in Albany here, I was like a second string Capitol Bureau member for the Knicker, uh, Knickerbocker News and the Times Union. But I later uh, had the honor with, uh, and, and the pleasure of working with, with Governor Kerry in, in fairly recent times. And, uh, you know, the fires were, were undimmed. And they were on issues of the sort that I work on, that is, fiscal issues. Um, Governor Carey and his good friend Walter Riston, who was a longtime patron of, of the Manhattan Institute, the former head of, of Citibank, um, had both been involved in the, in the fiscal crisis rescue. Walter Riston had been an important participant then. And the governor and Walter Riston and Felix Rodin were very concerned when the city of New York 
used its emergency borrowing authority that it had gained from 9-11 from as a pretext for essentially blowing open the deficit uh, limits of the Emergency Financial Control Act. This is not much commented on. It was commented on and upon by, at the time by Walter Riston and by Governor Carey. Um, they were concerned that the Financial Control Board had not even bothered to take a look at this uh, and, in fact, had not said a word about it. They thought that there was a danger that the fiscal controls that had been put in place and the checks and balances might be eroded. And this was something I can tell you from talking to Governor Carey at the time he was genuinely concerned about. A few years later, we had Prop Proposal 1 in New York State, in which the legislature, after a standoff with Governor Pataki and, and out of unhappiness over a Court of Appeals ruling uh, interpreting the governor's budget authority, passed a constitutional amendment, which many of us thought would actually weaken the, the executive budget authority and strengthen the legislature at the expense of the governor. Uh, governor Carey, again, was very concerned about that. We asked Governor Carey um, to appear at a forum we held on this issue in Manhattan, the Manhattan Institute sponsored. Uh, he readily agreed to do it. He spoke quite eloquently and forcefully at this event. Uh, Ed Koch agreed to appear at the events uh, immediately upon being informed that Hugh Carey was participating in it and used his time on the program to just laud Governor Carey, uh, with whom he had not always gotten along when he was mayor. Um, and uh, the long and short of it is he was an influential vote against this constitutional amendment, which failed, ultimately. He wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Post also against it. And I, again, talking to him uh, on the phone several times about this, he, was very, you know, he, he made his points, he said what he wanted to say, and it clearly uh, mattered to him <clears throat> a great deal. And there was nothing in it for him except what he believed needed to be done. And so I think that, again, I'd like to, to, to second uh, and expand on something uh, with which uh, Jerry concluded his remarks. Uh, I think that uh, we've had a number of governors in New York who, who would stand as great, great at least in the magnitude of their accomplishments. Certainly Nelson Rockefeller in terms of the magnitude of his accomplishments and his vision would be ranked among the greats. Whether that uh, legacy of Nelson Rockefeller's is uh, positive or not is another question in many respects. Uh, and we began to question that, I think, almost as soon as he began to leave office, if not before. But we've had a handful of governors who would be considered great. I think, and I've, I've long thought, that you carries has the has and will have the most enduring and positive legacy of any governor of the late 20th century in New York. And I think we're going to continue to realize that, and I think his, his reputation is going to continue to grow and, and, and to be strengthened in years ahead. So I'm very honored to be here today, and I look forward to taking part in the discussion. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for any, dis any uh, uh, comments or questions. Um, the, uh, we have some legislators here. We have De Assemblyman Denny Farrell here and Senator uh, Breslin, I believe, is here. Um, and um, uh, Assemblyman uh, uh, Jack McEnany is here too. So if, you would, if any of you would like to make any comments, uh, so, or anyone else? Yes? Okay, let's, uh, we'll use the microphone because we're recording all of this. Please stand up and, and, and identify yourself as well. Thank you. I'm Mary Ann Carrie Hayes. I think I would throw this one to Peter Goldmark if he wants to field it, but, uh, so much of the comment has been, where is this kind of leadership today? And if it was really ironic timing, right around the time of the passing was when the, the debt ceiling negotiations were going on and the, the country's debt was downgraded. And how do you think that could have, would be approached by the Kerry, if they, were, if they were in the White House today, how do you think that they would have, the Kerry administration would have approached it differently in terms of dealing with Congress to, to get that? That done in a more elegant way than it did. <laughs> Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> there you go. That's so tough. I've I've thought many times what you just said, which is what a different world it is. Uh, I was heartbroken this summer at those negotiations over the deadline. I was embarrassed for my country, and. Uh, ashamed about some of the standards in public life that, that we saw. 
Hugh Carey wouldn't have had anything to do with that. I don't know if the Times would have allowed or rewarded his style. There's no way to know because nobody did it the way he would do it. There was no fighter. Go back to the, to the uh, characteristics we talked about. There was nobody around with the grit and the compassion he had. Um, it wouldn't have come out the way it came out if he'd been president. But remember, this story isn't over. I don't know how this one is going to come out. All they did was kick the can down the road, and all the clocks are still ticking. Yeah. So I will, I'll just take a second with all of you here. that We, we are in the house today of, of an organization that believes government is important and tries to study and celebrate and find what's right and good about government, which after all is the, it's the collective enterprise in running our lives together. It's not some evil disease you catch government. It's the effort of human beings to, to govern the public sphere together. Not all spheres, but the public sphere. And I believe that we as a country are fairly lost right now. And uh, we have to find the right leaders, Marianne, and we have to draw on the best in ourselves. And we have to listen to each other and not pillory each other. The first step begins with listening to the other guy, not preaching to him. But we are way off course. Let me, let me just add to that thought something that I talk about sometimes when I'm teaching a class, which is what is America admired for around the world? We're not admired for our military strength or our armies. There have been other empires with great armies. Other nations are great military strength, and we're not primarily admired by other countries for our industrial and commercial strength. There are other great commercial powers. There is one right now that is bidding to surpass us. We're admired for the way we governed ourselves and for our institutions and values of government, our checks and balances, our civil liberties, our self-government. That's what other people admired about us. And we better find a way to get back on the right track. So no magic answer, Marianne. But the pain and the cry that brings you to ask that is also, I think it's present in me, and I bet it's present in a lot of people in this room. And it would have been in your father. Thank you very much. Just one more. I would just like to add to that. I think, oh, uh, thinking about what happened this uh, summer and the negotiations, I think credit should be given to Senator Anderson. I, uh, there was leadership that it was intelligent in opposition, or that was reasonable, that you, to whom you could talk, who had the welfare of the state in mind. And the second point I want to make that hasn't been made today is, uh, is Governor Kerry's integrity. And I came from the political world. When he first ran, I was his campaign, campaign chairman. And uh, it was the most honest administration I think this state has ever seen. And one of the things I think about, when I went over to the, the tax department and, and the, and the uh, finance area, there were millions of dollars of state money in various banks never receiving a penny's worth of interest. And during that crisis, that we cut that out, and uh, it was just, uh, I mean, it had other political reasons for doing it, but uh, Governor Kerry always kept his eye on the ball. Good government, clean government, and the people got it. Thank you very much. All right. I think one more. Yes. Um, one question that I have for everybody is that uh, I noticed that during um, Governor George Pataki's administration that he had uh, Governor Kerry involved in, in, um, in joining him on certain efforts. And I just wondered if there could be a little bit of discussion about that collaboration, maybe why Governor Kerry participated in that, and is there a tradition of governors doing that in New York? Panelists. Well, it's quite unusual, especially across party lines. One, uh, uh, Governor Mario Cuomo was anathema to Governor Pataki. So he had a successor who he didn't communicate with, wasn't invited to uh, the state of the state message, wasn't included. And uh, he found, and Governor Carey's uh, uh, conservatism uh, came more forward after he left government. 
I think. He was less constrained by the, the coalition that made him go. And uh, so I thought there was a certain comfort in, in uh, ideological, potential ideological connectedness and a certain value in, in cross-party connectedness and a, and a willingness to engage with each other. But that's, uh, that's an, I, I observed that, but I don't have any personal knowledge of it. And I don't know, have a personal knowledge of the relationship between the two men. Others in the room might have. But it was um, uh, an, uh, unusual for New York, I think. I don't, I don't, it's not working. Okay. Um, you turn it on from mute, push it from mute to not mute. I think I did, but, um, okay. I just would point out a, a minor thing. Uh, I think Nelson Rockefeller's main public appearance in Albany was at a dedication of the Empire State, State Plaza that was seen as a virtual endorsement of Hugh Carey when he was running for re-election. Yeah. So it's not may not be quite the same as working with a predecessor, but yeah. it was much commented upon at the time. Right. Yeah. Okay. It is an interesting. I recall an interesting quotation from uh, Governor Kerry, which he, uh, I guess, made a, a comment uh, that Nelson Rockefeller had been a good governor, and he was taken up on that comment. And his remark was, "I meant that in the way that all men are good." <laughs> 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 an, an illustration of the wit that I. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you very much. Um, Michelle, does this belong to you? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, Governor Kerry's leadership to, in the fiscal crisis, GM. but. Uh, it was a complex crisis, and the story of the full crisis was not told in detail before Seymour Lachman and Robert Poner wrote their wonderful book, The Man Who Saved New York. This book was published by SUNY Press in July 2010, and uh, we have a little, uh, op we have an opportunity to both honor that book as well as to, uh, to give Seymour a, uh, an opportunity to speak. Seymour Lachman served as president of the New York City Board of Education and as university dean of the City University of New York for being, before being elected to the New York State Senate, where he served five terms. He's co-authored two books about New York State government, including the book we honor today, as well as Three Men in a Room, The Inside Story of Power and Betrayal in an American State House. Seymour Lachman was consulting editor of the United States uh, the, the book, The United States in the Middle East, and he was co-author of One Nation Under God, Religion in Contemporary American Society. He's currently director of the Hugh Carey Institute for Government Reform at Wagner College on Staten Island, where he's a distinguished professor in residence. We will hear from uh, Senator Lockman in a moment, but first I would like to introduce Christine Ward, who is the New York State Archivist and Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Archives Partnership Trust. Christine Ward leads one of the uh, premier state archives in the nation, a position to which she was appointed by the Board of Regents in 2003. Christine began her professional career with the Albany Institute of History and Art, joining the New York State Archives as a senior archivist in 1981. Now please join me in welcoming Christine Ward. Is this working? You can hear me? Good. Um, well, this is the first year that the New York State Archives Partnership Trust uh, has uh, uh, presented the uh, Empire State History Book Award. And when, when we were deciding to inaugurate this award for the best book on the subject of New York State history, we determined that we would look for a book that both inspired and illuminated didn't take long to fall on this wonderful book. Since its initial release, our 2011 selection has done exactly that. We first became aware of this year's winner during the 2010 gubernatorial campaign. As New York State was struggling, and still is, to recover from a devastating national recession, uh, this book <coughs> truly galvanized attention, and it became a must read a veritable how-to of turning the Empire State around in times of fiscal crisis. Indeed, 
for its insight, for its wisdom, and for its careful, careful reflection on hard times. This book has been referenced by government leaders up to and including Governor Cuomo. We at the Archives Partnership Trust are very, very proud to add to its plaudits. Now, earlier this year, back in the spring, at the Empire State Book Festival, we presented this award to one of the book's two collaborators, reporter Rob Polner. Regrettably, we were not able at that time to honor the individual without whom this book would not have been possible. And so I am very, very pleased that we are able to do that today. Senator Lackman, would you please join me up here at the podium? We have a plaque for the award. It's my great pleasure to present to you the 2011 Empire State History Book Award. And it is for the incomparable work, The Man Who Saved New York. Thank you very, very much. So welcome. Uh, what this shows, and um, what Chris did not mention, uh, and I want to thank Chris for her efforts on our behalf in terms of being the New York State Archivist, and also Bob Bullock in his efforts in terms of the New York State uh, Archives Partnership Trust. Uh, the book couldn't have been written without uh, the two of you, and let me just say very uh, upfront that this book shows that a great human being can inspire a couple of mediocre authors to write a very, very good book. <laughs> and I mean every word of that. Uh, it was a great pleasure and a great delight. But, and I know that a memorial mass was held this morning, this book could never have seen the light of day without the life and times of a great governor, an outstanding congressman, an outstanding colonel, and one of the rare people of the 20th and 21st centuries. He was a man that grew and became bigger with every major challenge he faced. It wasn't only that he almost became seven feet tall physically, but more he grew as a human being throughout the years. And in many ways, he was very unique. And almost two months after his death, I would just want to say a few things about him, about a man who was inspired not only the 11 children that are here today, but many family members and a legion of friends throughout the nation, and believe it or not, throughout the world. Now, a lot has been said about you, Carrie. In fact, I'm going to try to keep my message within the time limit allotted to me and take off my watch. But as a, polit a part politician, as well as professor, forgive me if I try to emphasize a few things that might not have been emphasized, or even if had been mentioned, I felt that I feel that should be mentioned again. Um, let me say that, and I know that Michael and um, Gan, uh, Gaze and the um, uh, Peter Goldmark and the three distinguished panelists have touched upon these issues, but. 
one thing they did not mention, which showed the guts and the courage and the wisdom and the spirituality of this man was his opposition to the death penalty. At a time when everyone felt it was the in thing to do, just as everyone feels, many people feel, it's the wrong thing to do today. Not only in reference to presidential candidates who govern certain states, but throughout the nation. You, carry had the guts and courage to risk re-election, defeat in re-election, to risk giving up a chance at the vice presidential and presidential nomination in his day and his age, because he took a principled approach to opposition and the threat of vetoing a death penalty bill when it was passed and was to be passed by the legislature. He held them at bay at great political cost. And he did this, and I use the word spiritual again, because he was a devout Catholic who took his religious beliefs to heart and had them guide his life. I saw this when he, I was a member of the committee on the future of Catholic education that Governor Pataki appointed him to. This is be just before I became a New York State Senator when we drew a road map for the future of Catholic education and I witnessed him for the first time in action in chairing a committee behind closed doors. I had known him for a long time before that. But it was also another issue, another event, World War II, that gave you, Carrie, a reverence for life. He was a man who entered as a private, like being a cavalry man, and when the war ended, he was a colonel. And he was a survivor of the liberation of the Remagen Bridge, which became a major entry point of the Allied armies defeating Nazi Germany. And he was the liberator. His unit liberated the infamous Nordhausen concentration camp. I will never forget during the 1974 gubernatorial election that when you Carey was campaigning in this congressional district on 13th Avenue in Brooklyn. And I had the honor and privilege to live in that district. A man ran out of a store, hugged you Carey and kissed him an Orthodox Jewish man who owned a butcher shop who said, you saved my life and you saved the lives of thousands of others by leading in the liberation of the infamous Nordhausen concentration camp. So his reverence for life came about because of a deep religious faith put into action and the experiences in World War II, where not only did many of his best friends and officers and men in the unit that he served under die, but also he saw the horrors of genocide and the Holocaust first up. And he then said, no man should ever have the right to take another man's life not under my watch. Now, before he became governor of New York State, I first met, I don't even know if the family realizes this, you carry, when I was a college student at Brooklyn College at a very, very important time, and that was in the 1960 presidential election. When you carry's great hero, great hero, national hero, was running for president. And uh, he adored and loved JFK and what he stood for, just as he adored and loved the man whose equal in many ways he was, Alfred E. Smith. 
uh, who when he was governor of New York State and when he unfortunately lost a race for president of the United States before a Great Depression. I remember you, Carey, being inspired by people who went before him and building upon this inspiration a record that was somewhat unique. I mean, people don't realize the impact he had in the US Congress. And I don't mean he almost became majority leader in the House of Representatives. I mean a concrete thing which meant a great deal to me when I wrote a previous book, One Nation Under God, Religion and Contemporary American Society, and when I served as president of the New York City Board of Education, which we have to reflect upon. He was one of the outstanding legislators that New York State ever sent to the US Congress. He took an issue, an issue that existed from one Johnson to another Johnson, the lack of a national involvement in education. This became an issue in 1865 under the presidency of Andrew Johnson. And it continued until 1965 for 100 years until the presidency of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, why was it 100 years before it was passed as legislation and signed by the president. There were many reasons for it. There were issues of federalism, the federal government and the state government, but there was one major issue that few people discuss. We have to admit it was a split. It was a Christian divide between Protestant Congress people and senators and Catholic Protestant and Catholic congressmen. This divide persisted for 100 years until a then youthful, youthful man who served on the House Ways and, Com Ways and Means Committee decided to try to rectify it by bringing about a major compromise, perhaps not comparable to Henry Clay's compromise, but much more lasting. And that was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I read about Lyndon Johnson saying, who is this guy from Brooklyn? Who's this Brooklyn politician? He didn't realize this was a budding national leader. He dared, he dared confront me he dared say that I, the President of the United States, the head of the LBJ family with Lady Bird Johnson, and in Johnson City we live in a ranch called LBJ Ranch, he dared defy the great President and say we must have a compromise so that Catholic education would be recognized and given funding at least in the area of special education. He convinced LBJ, and not just because he had a ride on Air Force One. It would take concrete action to convince you, Carrie, to compromise on an issue that was essential, essential to what he thought was good for America. And ESEA was a breakthrough for the federal government's involvement in the 50 states' control of public education. Now, I mentioned the death penalty. I mentioned the, just now, ESEA and how important it was. There were so many things I could talk about at this point, but I don't want to because you've heard far better speakers with far more knowledge speaking before me. But I want to mention something that all the speakers touched upon and put it in a context and a framework that it hasn't been put into except by one man, Hugh Carey. Hugh Carey said several times to me in several interviews, we had an interview when I wrote my uh, when we wrote our first book on state government, 
in which he commented on Nelson Rockefeller. He has nothing bad to say about him. He said he was a man who was able to control one political party and least the other major political party in the same state. Uh, but there are other stories that we heard about Rockefeller and Carey. But Carey epitomized what he felt was lacking in today's America. And I think we all agree with him. He said what is lacking is a political process called mirthology. Mirthology? What does mirthology mean? I know the Carey family members understood what that means. It means going across the political aisle. It means treating people with civility, with good stories, with camaraderie, reg regardless of whether they are Republican or Democratic. Regardless of whether they are Southern conservative Democrats like Mendel Rivers, who was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, regardless whether it was an unknown congressman from Grand Rapids, Michigan, called what was his name again? Gerald Ford. <laughs> or his deputy from Arizona, John Rhodes, who later succeeded him when Gerald Ford moved to uh, not the White House initially, but to the vice presidency before Nelson Rockefeller. And people such as Congressman Melvin Laird, later Defense Secretary Melvin Laird, all of whom were enlisted by the governor of the state of New York at the apex of his political career to help him in making sure that neither New York City nor New York State goes bankrupt. To the point where the Chancellor of West Germany at that time, when asked by President Ford how the Bundesmark is doing, said, I don't want to hear this nonsense about the Bundesmark. How, what are you doing to save America, to save New York State, to save New York City, to save the nations of Europe? This will have a domino effect if you don't support the governor of the state of New York, and it won't just be, it won't just be uh, you, but us as well. That is why and I think I sent copies of this to the Carey children, the London Daily Telegraph, the official paper basically, the unofficial paper of the Conservative Party and David Cameron at your father's passing, at our great friend's passing, had a, an obit that was surprising in the length and the quality of its message. He said, this man's death, and even more so his life, should be recognized not only by Americans, whether they're in New York or Washington, but by Europeans in London, in Paris, in Berlin, because he did something which we must replicate today with the problems that we have. So when Andrew Cuomo was running for governor, he only had it partially correct when he said, we, the people of New York State, and I, as your governor, must use this man's life as a roadmap for the problems we face today, the major economic issues that beset us. These problems now are global problems. And they're besetting the European nations, and the European Union, NATO, et cetera. And what the London Daily Telegraph was saying was that the message of this unique, great human being echoes today in terms of the solutions he recommended with his outstanding staff and family members. It echoes throughout Europe, throughout Asia, 
throughout the world. And that's what we have to remember about you, Carrie. The greatness of what an individual can bring to world problems, national problems, state and city problems, we will never, ever forget this human being in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Seymour. We have one, I know we're running a little bit late, but we have one more speaker. Nancy Kerry Cassidy is Executive Vice President and CEO of the uh, Peacott uh, Companies, the premier commercial real estate firm in New York State's uh, capital region. Her many honors for community service include being named by Capital District Physicians Health Plan as one of its terrific 25 leaders who exemplify dedication to public service and personal sacrifice to improve the lives of others. As just one example of her service, Nancy was the key driving force behind Dancing in the Woods, an annual event that was raised more than $5 million for the child cancer program at Albany Medical Center, where she's vice president or vice chair of the board of directors. She's also a member of the board of trustees of the Albany Academies and has served on the board of the New York State Thruway Authority. Nancy's a graduate of the College of New Rochelle and holds an MBA from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Please, Nancy. You're very welcome, Seymour. It's nice. I'd like to keep it though. I don't know how you summarize a day like today, um, except uh, perhaps those of you who have heard us the nickname Huge. I think today was a huge day to remember our father, Hugh Carey, um, your governor, a governor for not only hard winters, but all seasons in New York. I think we have to remember that he didn't look at things on a blank canvas. Um, Hugh Carey looked at things in multidimensional ways. For example, when you think about the I Love New York campaign or the Empire State Games, you think about tourism and you think about sports. But to Hugh Carey, they were economic development. They were the engine that were going to bring business into New York. When you think about leadership, while you think about Hugh Carey, you also have to think about David Burke. and You have to think about Peter Goldmark and Jim Introne and Clarence Sundrum and Jim Tully. And what I want you to think about is going forward, where do we find, not the Hugh Carries, but where do we find those people? And how do we entice them to come back to state government? State government, federal government, it's been somehow tainted. Why? I don't know. I don't have the answer. Um, my siblings and I, we work behind the scenes to get good candidates elected. Why we haven't followed in our father's footsteps is something that I think we hold very personal because we saw, um, yeah, we, we just saw a greatness that uh, although he wanted us to follow on, I think he wanted us to be in the trenches, not to be there with our names and the headlights. So where do we find those people? And that's my challenge to you. This is an institute of government. This has leaders. I see elected officials. I see people from um, civic groups. I see academia. So how do we get that done? That's what I think we should be thinking about today. We started off with a mass that um, talked about my father's faith, which was very strong. We talked about the love of family, which anyone who have ever met him or any one of us knows will endure forever. But what we want to go forward, we want to remember, remember his humor, his heart, his enduring um, never give up ever, no matter what the adversity that was facing him. Um, he was told that when um, they finally decided to give New York the bonds, that he had to personally guarantee every one of them. Can you imagine if three-in-one credit was around today? He wouldn't have done very well after doing that. But he said, I'll do it because I have faith in what we've put together. Um, I'm very honored that so many of you came out today, that so many of you were with us at Mass. I think it's been a long day, and I think we all want to probably um, end up. But on a high note, I just want to tell you that I know my father's there, and I know he's looking down, and I know he's smiling, and he's probably whistling a nice Irish tune, and maybe going off for a walk with our mother, but that he's very proud of all of you, his colleagues, his friends, his associates, his family, and I thank you. Thank you.